In the name of one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Good morning. It is such a treat for me to be back in my hometown and especially to be with each of you all here today. St. Paul's holds a very special place in my heart. Uh, many years ago, before I moved out of the area, I used to come to services here from time to time. I can remember coming on several occasions to watch family members and the children of friends in the annual Christmas pageant. And I have a particular fond set of memories of sitting right about back there and enjoying one of many beautiful organ recitals performed by Roger Cole. And thanks to the hospitality of Diane and Todd, I've even had the chance from time to time to slip into the Gilchrist room and spend some uninterrupted time working on a sermon for my preaching class at seminary. Seminary's been quite an amazing journey. And I'm honored that you've all welcomed me here today to be my companions on just this one small leg of the journey. So how would you feel if a good friend of yours called you up and said they were coming by for a visit? And when you ask them what time you can expect them, they respond, oh, you'll know when we get there, just be ready. Or imagine you've gone out to dinner at Jimmy's on the James. And after placing your order, you ask your server how long you'll have to wait for the meal. What you get in your response to your question is the server looking at you and smiling and saying, about that day and hour, only the chef knows. <laughs> in today's reading from Matthew, Jesus is that friend coming to visit and the server bringing you your meal. But what he's offering is much more than a chat or a fine entree. He's offering a hint as to when he will return and humanity will reach the end of the age. Or is he? Unfortunately for those traveling with Jesus, this wasn't quite the hint they were seeking. When the disciples gathered around him on the Mount of Olives, they asked point blank when he would return and what signs they should be on the lookout for. They wanted a definitive answer. Who wouldn't? It's human nature to want specific answers, to know exactly when and where things will happen. One of the most often used functions on my cell phone is the calendar. I always want to be able to know what's on my schedule, when it'll start, and when it can be expected to wrap up. And I don't know anyone who doesn't want clear signs when they're on a journey, to know that they're almost home when they see the big oak tree at the end of the street, or to know that they need to make a right-hand turn when they get to the intersection of Memorial and Fort. But think about the number of times, though, that Jesus didn't give easy markers, easily understandable, easy to follow answers. With rare exception, the lessons that he shared, primarily through parables and discourses, such as the one we heard a few minutes ago, were given in a way that made folks think. Now, giving someone the answer is easy. It's like somebody giving you the answer to your homework. You're going to get a hundred, but you haven't learned anything in the process. Things are much more rewarding. We learn so much more if we have to work for the answer. For the disciples, that made for what I'm sure were some very frustrating situations. Often they weren't able to walk away from these conversations with Jesus with anything definite. The assuredness that two plus two equals four. For them, the math that Jesus offered was much more abstract. An equation where two plus two equals something they just couldn't figure out. For us as Christians, however, perhaps that fact that things aren't always clear and it's a struggle to make sense of them is one of the most important lessons we can learn. Being a follower of Jesus isn't a simple equation. Quite the contrary. Following Jesus, even in the most casual and simplest manner, 
is hard. And if we try to follow Jesus the way that we're supposed to, we find the bar of difficulty raised even higher. Jesus tells us not to worry about when things will happen. We are to simply be ready, ready for the unexpected hour of his arrival. A few days ago, I climbed Mill Mountain in Roanoke with my wife and one of our two daughters. Now, I admittedly, climbing mountains is not something I've done much of in recent years, so every time I try it, it's a challenge. As I worked my way to the top, I viewed the climb in much the same way I view today's lesson. I was too focused on the end. When am I going to be there? How much farther is this? And I did so to the exclusion of everything that I could have looked at and enjoyed and wondered at during the climb. So what if we start to view things differently? What if instead of always spending our time wondering about what's coming at the end, when and where the solutions to life's problems will appear, we instead focus on the things that make up the right now? Starting today in this Advent season, this time of hopeful expectation, we are called to patiently wait. We are to be ready, and we're to be observant and watchful. But our watchfulness isn't limited strictly to awaiting Christ's birth or his return in the last days. If we live and act by focusing on the example set by Jesus, we should also be watching for our brothers and sisters in the family of God. Even while waiting for Christ, we can and should spend our, spend our time living like Christ. And that requires doing something that's counterintuitive to many of us. We should stop worrying about what's going to happen down the road tomorrow or next week or next month. Instead, we should worry about the here and the now. And along with that, we shouldn't worry about the things that we can't see. We should instead focus our time and attention on the things that are right in front of us. There's much in the world that we can't help but notice. The past few weeks have done nothing else if not expose some deep social and political divisions in this country. Regardless of personal views, I trust you would all agree that when our society or any segment of our population is hurt, all of creation feels the pain. I grieve with friends and loved ones in the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community as they continue to face discrimination and threats even as this country makes such strides in acceptance. In North Dakota, we're watching as the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, along with our own presiding bishop and thousands of other bishops, priests, and ordinary men, women, and children from across the country, have stood in opposition to a pipeline that could potentially damage their water supply and most assuredly damage their cultural heritage and identity. We live in a country where on one night last year, well over half a million people nationwide were living in shelters, transitional housing, or in the streets. Here in Lynchburg, even this year, there were 138 families and 174 individuals experiencing homelessness. Men, women, and children, black and white, victims of illness and violence, military veterans. And while the numbers are dropping and we're making strides, there are still brothers and sisters living in very precarious circumstances. We live in a world where those facing the certainty of violence and repression in their homeland risk everything they have for the great unknown that awaits them as they join the flood of refugees traveling around the world to find safety for themselves and their families. My friends, this is our here and now. The kingdom we've been promised will come, but there's nothing to say that we can't work now 
to bring a bit of that kingdom about in the present day. It's not enough to worry about the problems. We should take action. And there's nothing stopping us from making this Advent season a time of action, of extending a hand to those in need, a hug to those who have been hurt, our hearts to every brother and sister in creation. Henry Nouwen wrote that waiting is essential to the spiritual life. But as a discipline of Jesus, he says, it isn't empty waiting. Waiting for God is an active, alert, and joyful waiting. As we wait, we remember him who we expect to return. And as we remember him, we create a community ready to welcome him when he comes. Yes, only God knows the hour and day of Christ's return. But what will we do with the time we have while we're waiting? What will we do to make Advent a time when we can glimpse the coming kingdom? Amen.